So what I learned from that history and my own career of, wow, 24, I guess, years, no, more, since 1991, of advocacy of um, gay equality, same-sex marriage, I've learned that the censors have a false model of where hateful prejudice comes from and what to do about it. They think it comes from words. They think it comes from people saying stuff, but they're wrong. Most Americans, in fact, there are a few who are sociopathic Nazis, but most Americans don't get up every morning and say, who can I hate on today? Who can I vilify? The reason for prejudice of the kind that I faced for most of my life isn't hate per se, it's fear and it's ignorance. If you think that I, the homosexual person, am going to sexually assault your child, that I'm going to recruit your child into the homosexual underworld lifestyle, or if you think as a Christian or Muslim or Jew that I am going to bring God's wrath down upon the country, or that I am convicting myself to an eternity of damnation, or if you think that I'm twisted and sick and have a mental disorder, I promise you, you will fear and hate me. And you will think that you are right to do so. Not out of animus, but you'll think you're doing it out of sympathy. How do you fight hatred and prejudice when it comes from that? There's only one way to do it. You have to replace the fear and ignorance with better ideas. You have to show people the truth. That's what Frank Kameny and many others did. It's what a lot of people tried to do. So the bad news is that this is a very slow process. It took a couple generations to get America from where it was to where it is. The good news is that by the standards of human history, this is incredibly fast, much faster than most earlier civil rights movements. And the reason for that is that we had more freedom to make the case, and we had more channels to make it with. Um, what Frank Kamen, he understood, is that you fight prejudice not by suppressing it, but by confronting and exposing it. I heard him do this. You know, he was on a panel with a guy named Robert Knight, who's still around, at the uh, Family Research Council. And I recall his saying, in as many words, if your God thinks that my love is immoral, then you worship a false and bigoted God. Which is how he talked. Interesting thing about Frank Kameny is you could tell him he was a stupid fucking faggot. He didn't care. You were going to get it back from Frank Kameny. <laughs> we changed minds by showing that we were on the side of love and the side of decency and by proving the haters were wrong. And gradually they came to see that they were wrong. Many of them became our supporters and friends. And from that, I then learned two other things. First of all, we, minorities, I don't care what your minority is, are better off in a society that protects hate speech than in a society that protects us from hate speech. The second thing I learned is that there is nothing safe about so-called safe spaces because they're safe for intellectual laziness, for ignorance, for moral complacency, for enforced conformity, and for authoritarianism. They are not safe for us. So assume, to go back to my original question, assume the hatred festoon society and the magic perfect speech code. I would still be against it. It would not be confronting the problem to silence the speech that we don't like. It would be instead like fighting global warming by breaking all the thermometers. We need to know who the haters are, or we need, they're not usually haters. We need to know who the people are with wrong-headed ideas so that we can see them, we can confront them, we can correct them, and we can compare ourselves to them. 
Here is something that you haven't heard much, but it's true. The haters did us a big favor in the gay rights movement. Every time Frank Phelps and Westboro Baptist Church went out and picketed the funeral of a military service member carrying a sign that said, God hates fags. Um, and every time someone saw that and compared that with gay people peaceably protesting or peaceably lobbying, saying, we'd like to marry and express our love in the most socially responsible way, Fred Phelps sure made us look good by comparison. Haters, in the end, bury themselves if you let them talk. I recognize Frank Kameny was a very special guy. He stepped forward when almost no one else would. There were other pioneers. Don't have time to get into all that. But remember, we don't all need to be Frank Kameny. In a society that allows free expression, we only need a few Frank Kamenys, but they have to be determined, they have to make good arguments, and they have to have the opportunity to speak. And remember, it's always the people with the cutting edge social ideas, the people who seem the most outlandish and wrongheaded. It's always from those sectors that society's moral insights ultimately come. That isn't to say that every person with a weird idea is right, but it is to say that most moral innovation, as H.L. Mencken said, is welcomed by polite society about as much as a wave of smallpox. Um, being in a minority, you know, it's a burden, right? People say we're marginalized, we're oppressed. That's a bad thing. People talk about, you know, a way to think about it is the minority tax. You come to a university that is majority white and cisgender and heterosexual and whatever, and you're a minority. Um, and there is a kind of burden of constantly justifying yourself, constantly explaining, defending, educating. Um, Middlebury, uh, some students wrote a letter, public letter, saying free speech was bad because it's a burden, quote, on specific groups of students, asking them to continually defend their right to exist in an academic community for the supposed intellectual enrichment of that same community. Well, I take issue with the word supposed. I think airing these, uh, these ideas is real, not supposed intellectual enrichment. But the rest of that statement is, in fact, true. Minorities do face a kind of extra burden of self-defense. And by minorities, I don't mean necessarily people of color or homosexuals or women or whatever. I also mean intellectual minorities, the people who step on campus with the strange and unpopular ideas that just might have a kernel of truth. Is that unfair? Yes. Is it burdensome? Yes. For gay people, quote, defending our right to exist for the intellectual enrichment of our community was a pain in the butt. I promise you life would have been easier and better for me if I hadn't had to live through it. But here are some things that you don't really hear enough, I think, in the context of this discussion. One, please, I say this as a member of two certified oppressed minorities, gay and Jewish. If you don't believe the oppressed part, go to Russia right now for Jews. Uh, I'm sorry, for, for gay people. Uh, also Jews in many places. And please, for heaven's sake, don't protect us. We don't want your protection. We want protection from violence, absolutely and unconditionally. That's why we thank those people in the back of the room. But please do not protect me from hateful, bigoted, wrongful ideas. We, gay people, fought for years against the stereotype of weakness and defenselessness. Remember the words that were used for us? Limp wrist, pansy, fruit, sissy. Am I your inferior? Am I a sinner? Am I a sicko? Well, tell me. I am not afraid to hear that. And guess what? You're going to hear back from me. A lot of campuses have these things now apparently called bias incident reporting systems. Do you have that at AU? These are like anonymous complaint boxes where students can complain about things other students are saying without apparently putting their name on it and can launch investigations. So as you can imagine, I don't like that idea for all kinds of reasons. But there is a bias incident reporting system that I support very strongly. 
And here it is. If you're biased against me, report it to me. <laughs> and you will hear back from me. I will not run to the university or the government and say, please protect me from this awful person. I'm capable of doing that myself. And indeed, that is essential, I think, for minorities like me to retain our self-esteem and our respect for ourselves. Second, hate speech helped us. As I said earlier, it gives us a foil. It lets us prove our mettle. It lets us make our arguments. It gives us a platform. And finally, you know, the tax of being a minority in a majoritarian society, whether it's a campus or America, it is a burden, but it's also a gift. Um, dissidents and minorities and outsiders see society better. We pick up things that other people's, people miss, where societies, consciences, moral pioneers, where the canaries in the, in the mine shaft. We're interesting, we have a story, and we also have the privilege of advocacy to make the country better, to make the university better. And that's also something we need to be a bit more cheerful about, I think. In Middlebury, um, the student letter I mentioned praised the, the courage of protesters who had shut down a lecture by Charles Murray, a con controversial conservative scholar. The letter said, and I quote, they took the great risk of standing up. Um, I'd like to take exception to that. I don't think it's brave to try to silence ideas you disagree with. I think it's a form of cowardice to do that. I think bravery comes from confronting those ideas rather than hiding from them, shielding yourself, or trying to shield others. Minorities do bear a special burden. We always will. We should embrace that burden, as Frank Kameny did. Um, it's interesting to me to note that in his very long career of activism, in his very aggressive career, Kameny never once called for anyone to be censored or silenced. That was not in his playbook. He meant it when he said he was fighting for the freedom of all Americans against tyranny over the mind. 